Well, good morning and Merry Christmas to everybody. <laughs> yeah, springtime in Alberta. And uh, so, uh, as we were saying a minute ago before the service, uh, the moisture is good for the farmers and, and the crops, so we give thanks for that and pray everybody uh, travels safely in the midst of uh, any wintry conditions today. Let's uh, begin by bowing our heads in prayer together. Let's pray. Our loving God, thank you so much that we can gather together today. Thank you for the, the, the snow that reminds us of your, your love, purity, Lord, and just uh, uh, reminds us that you wash us uh, white as snow. We pray that all that occurs would draw us closer to you and, Lord, that we would be open to all you would desire to work in and through us in your world. All this we pray in the name of our risen Savior. Amen. Our opening hymn is one which uh, sings about uh, the new life that we have in our Lord. We have a new song, and the words are on our screen. season, we begin by sharing the Easter greeting together. Alleluia! Christ is risen. Lord is risen indeed. Alleluia! May his grace and peace be with you. May he fill our hearts with joy. We share together the collect for purity. Almighty God, to you all hearts are open, all desires known, and from you no secrets are hidden. Cleanse the thoughts of our hearts by the inspiration of your Holy Spirit, that we may perfectly love you and worthily magnify your holy name through Christ our Lord. Amen. Glory to God in the highest, and peace to God's people on earth. Lord God, Heavenly King, Almighty God and Father, we worship you, we give you thanks, we praise you for your glory. Lord Jesus Christ, only Son of the Father, Lord God, Lamb of God, you take away the sin of the world, have mercy on us. You are seated at the right hand of the Father, 
receive our prayer. For you alone are the Holy One, you alone are the Lord, you alone are the Most High, Jesus Christ, with the Holy Spirit, in the glory of God the Father. Amen. We share together the Collect of the Day. O God, your Son made himself known to his disciples in the breaking of bread. Open the eyes of our faith, that we may see him in his redeeming work, who is alive and reigns with you and the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. Another thing that we do throughout the Easter season, except for Easter 4, which uh, is next Sunday, and that's uh, Good Shepherd Sunday, so we always uh, say the 23rd Psalm on that day, but Every other Sunday in um, Easter season, we have a, a canticle at this point in our service, and our canticle uh, today is the Benedictus, and the words are on our screen. I invite you to say the parts that are in the yellow italics. Blessed be the Lord, the God of Israel. He has come to his people and set them free. He has raised up for us a mighty Savior, born of the house of his servant David. Through his prophets, he promised of old that he would save us from our enemies, from the hands of all who hate us. He promised to show mercy to our fathers and to remember his holy covenant. This was the oath he swore to our father Abraham, to set us free from the hands of our enemies free to worship him without fear, holy and righteous in his sight all the days of our life. You, my child, shall be called the prophet of the Most High, for you will go before the Lord to prepare his way, to give his people knowledge of salvation by the forgiveness of their sins. In the tender compassion of our God, the dawn from on high shall break upon us, to shine on those who dwell in darkness and the shadow of death, and to guide our feet into the way of peace. Glory to the Father, and to the Son, and to the Holy Spirit, as it was in the beginning, is now, and will be forever. Amen. Now we'll have our first reading from Holy Scripture. Our gradual hymn uh, speaks about us encountering our Lord through uh, the sacrament of the Eucharist. Let's sing now together, Blessed Are You, Lord.
Through your goodness, Lord, bread and wine are taken. Bread is your body, come to be our bread of life. Wine is your blood, and we offer both a sacrifice. Blessed be God forever. Blessed are you, Lord, taking on humanity. Through your goodness, Lord, we can share divinity. Bread is your body, come to be our bread of life. Wine is your blood, and we offer both a sacrifice. Blessed be God forever. Blessed are you, Lord, Son of God Almighty. Through your goodness, Lord, wash away iniquity. Bread is your body, come to be our bread of life. Wine is your blood, and we offer both a sacrifice. Blessed be God forever. Excuse me. Water went down the wrong way at the wrong time. <laughs> the Lord be with you. The Holy Gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ according to Luke. Glory to you, Lord Jesus Christ. Now on that same day, two of them were going to a village called Emmaus, about seven miles from Jerusalem, and talking with each other about all these things that had happened. While they were talking and discussing, Jesus himself came near and went with them, but their eyes were kept from recognizing him. And he said to them, What are you discussing with each other while you walk along? They stood still, looking sad. Then one of them, whose name was Cleopas, answered him, Are you the only stranger in Jerusalem who does not know the things that have taken place there in these days? He asked them, What things? They replied, the things about Jesus of Nazareth, who was a prophet, mighty in deed and word before God and all the people, and how our chief priests and leaders handed him over to be condemned to death and crucified him. But we had hoped that he was the one to redeem Israel. Yes, and besides all this, it's now the third day since these things took place. Moreover, some women of our group astounded us. They were at the tomb early this morning, and when they did not find his body there, they came back and told us that they had indeed seen a vision of angels who said that he was alive. Some of those who were with us went to the tomb and found it just as the women had said, but they did not see him. Then he said to them, Oh, how foolish you are, and how slow of heart to believe all that the prophets have declared. Was it not necessary that the Messiah should suffer these things and then enter into his glory? Then, beginning with Moses and all the prophets, he interpreted to them the things about himself in all the scriptures. As they came near the village to which they were going, he walked ahead as if he were going on. But they urged him strongly, saying, Stay with us, because it's almost evening and the day is now nearly over. So he went in to stay with them. When he was at the table with them, he took bread, blessed and broke it, and gave it to them. Then their eyes were opened, and they recognized him, and he vanished from their sight. They said to each other, Were not our hearts burning within us while he was talking to us on the road, while he was opening the scriptures to us? That same hour they got up and returned to Jerusalem, and they found the eleven and their companions gathered together. They were saying, 
The Lord has risen indeed, and he has appeared to Simon. Then they told what had happened on the road, and how he had been made known to them in the breaking of the bread. The Gospel of Christ. Praise to you, Lord Jesus Christ. May the words of my mouth and the meditation of all our hearts be now and ever acceptable in your sight, O Lord, our strength and our Redeemer. Amen. Yesterday was the uh, funeral for the Duke of Edinburgh, who passed away on April 9th at the wonderful age of 99 after an equally wonderful life. Prince Philip and all the royal family will be especially remembered in our prayer time today, but I thought I'd begin today's sermon with a tribute that bears testimony to His Royal Highness's sense of humor. The former Archbishop of Canterbury, Rowan Williams, said it was always very terrifying uh, to preach in front of Prince Philip because of his strong feelings on the length of the sermon. <clears throat> I was told very, very firmly that going over eight minutes would probably land me in the Tower of London, uh, Archbishop Williams recalls. <laughs> well, I'm afraid I can't promise to uh, keep today's sermon to eight minutes. <clears throat> as we have such a wonderful story in our gospel reading to look at. Uh, on the other hand, uh, if you're not watching today's service live, uh, you do have an option not available to His Royal Highness of fast forwarding or watching the sermon in four eight minute pieces. I'm just kidding about that last bit. <laughs> well, let's look at this story. The encounter between the risen Lord and two discouraged, overwhelmed disciples on the road to Emmaus. For the next few minutes, let's enter into that story together. It says, now on the same day, so the day of uh, resurrection, Easter day, two of them were going to a village called Emmaus, about seven miles from Jerusalem, and talking with each other about all these things that had happened. Two of them, as it says here, uh, verses 9 to 11 say that the women who were charged with the Easter good news to share that Jesus was risen told all this to the eleven and to all the rest. But these words seemed to them an idle tale and they did not believe them. So these are among that all the rest category. Uh, those followers of Jesus who were in Jerusalem, uh, companions of the apostles, but were not among the eleven. One is identified as Cleopas in verse 18. Uh, the other could be Cleopas' wife. Uh, John 19, verse 25, says that Mary, uh, speaks about Mary, the wife of Clopas, uh, in the Passion, as being there. And... Uh, Clopas is a variant of Cleopas, and, and uh, this Mary was at the cross, so it's certainly very possible that it's Cleopas and Mary. And uh, it says, while they were talking and discussing, Jesus himself came near and went with them, but their eyes were kept from recognizing him. Now, we all know how difficult it is to recognize someone out of context. Uh, you see your child's teacher at the supermarket, even before there were masks <laughs> that we were wearing, and you can't remember who they are. Um, certainly meeting Jesus on the road to Emmaus was an unexpected encounter like this for these two. And Donovan Drake writes, is that the trouble Cleopas and his friend were having on the road to Emmaus? They remembered a crucified Jesus. They remembered a dead Jesus. He was dead. Period. A risen Jesus is out of context. Is that why those two did not recognize him? 
But note how long this lasted, though. I mean, they are talking with Jesus uh, along the way, and we don't know exactly how long that was, but for some distance they're talking with him. And then, uh, then in the house as well over a meal. Also, of course, uh, we have John chapter 20, uh, in which uh, Mary doesn't recognize Jesus, uh, Mary Magdalene. And uh, in uh, John 21, it says even that Jesus is there uh, offering the, the disciples breakfast. They, and it says, none of them dared who, ask who it was. They knew it was Jesus. Um, and so there's something perhaps that's going on here that is a mystery. And when faced with mystery, it's really best to let it be what it is, a mystery. And so their eyes are kept from recognizing him for some reason. And it says, he said to them, what are you discussing with each other while you walk along? They stood still, looking sad. They stood still looking sad. That's really a, a snapshot of their discipleship, for it has seemed to come to a crashing halt, leaving them with a deep, bone-wearying sadness. And it says, then one of them, whose name was Cleopas, answered him, are you the only stranger in Jerusalem who doesn't know the things that have taken place there in these days? Uh, perhaps the most ironic statement in history, uh, certainly. Yes, Jesus is, he's aware of it. Uh, he kind of was quite involved, actually. Uh, and, uh, but Jesus is very gracious. He says, uh, what things? And encourages them to open up, and they do. They say, the things about Jesus of Nazareth, who was a prophet, mighty in deed and word before God and all the people, how our chief priests and leaders handed him over to be condemned to death and crucified him. Irony continues, as Drake points out. They tell the resurrected one about the resurrected one. And, uh, but think of this. This takes courage, what they're doing here. I mean, Jesus could have been a spy or something, after all, or a sympathizer with the authorities. And said, oh, you're one of them, are you? And, you know, but, but it all comes out. It's all being, and, uh, but then they say these words, but we had hoped that he was the one to redeem Israel. Now the word there, redeem, it's the Greek word lutruo, and it means to liberate from an oppressive situation, to set free, rescue, or redeem. So that's more than a prophet. <laughs> that is the Messiah. That's the one that they had been longing for, who would come uh, and uh, set them free. But notice the past tense here. But we had hoped. Not anymore. They're walking away from Jerusalem and uh, they're uh, following Jesus at the same time. Their, their hopes were dead and buried. They're discouraged. They're disillusioned. And uh, the reason it becomes clear is because they had been thinking of this being set free as deliverance from Roman oppression and crucifixion of Jesus was a devastating end to that hope. But note again the irony here. Jesus has just, in fact, done the very thing they say that they were hoping for. He has redeemed them through the cross. He's delivered them from the deepest bondage of all, the bondage within. Then they relate the empty tomb and the women's uh, sharing the Easter message from the angels. And they said this astounded them, totally unexpected, just like Jesus being there with them was totally unexpected. And they add, some of us, uh, some of those who were with us went to the tomb and found it just as the women had said, but they did not see him. They 
again, uh, pretty ironic given that they're talking right to Jesus. And that emphasis is on those last words, don't they? Him they did not see. And they don't appear to expect anything else. Ronald Blythe, who himself is now the remarkable age of 98, uh, he writes, they admitted their own faithlessness. They had simply and sadly tramped home. What we might ask had they been doing in Jerusalem all day? The women had gone to the tomb at the break of day and now it was late evening. It was about seven miles from the city to their village, about a two hour walk. Probably they had lain low until it began to get dark, scared of being picked up by the police. These two disciples traveling to the village of Emmaus were basically rats fleeing a sinking ship. And we could change the analogy and say there are animals going off to die away from the herd. Um, if only they had stayed just a little longer. Uh, think of Mary, of course, lingering by the tomb on Easter Sunday, as we, we looked at, <clears throat> or Thomas last week. Uh, of course, Thomas was the, the week after. He lingered, and Jesus met with him. The wondrous fact, though, in this story is that Jesus didn't say, well, if you just stuck around uh, with the others, but since you decided to leave, well, then that's the end of it. No, instead he went after them, like the good shepherd seeking the lost sheep. But Jesus' uh, reply is rather like a shepherd with a lost sheep. <laughs> they had those shepherd's crooks to kind of give the sheep a good yank and get them back where they should be. Uh, Jesus says, oh, how foolish you are and how slow of heart to believe all that the prophets have declared. Now remember why Jesus is appearing to them. He's appearing to them not so he can chew them out and then leave and that's the end of it. No, he's appearing to them because he loves them. But it is tough love. He's not saying, oh, you poor guys, you've been through so much. No, instead, he says, you guys do not get it. <laughs> uh, you uh, have eyes, but you're not seeing Was it not necessary that the Messiah should suffer these things and then enter into his glory? Not just, oh, isn't this a, a terrible thing, an accident that's happened somehow and that's completely out of, God, of the plan? He said, no. Was it not necessary that this should happen? That he should suffer these things and then enter into his glory? And then beginning with Moses and all the prophets, he interpreted to them the things about himself in all the scriptures. Now that wouldn't be just a series of proof texts where they say, oh, well, I guess I see from these couple of texts that, uh, that this had to happen. No, it's the whole story of creation and redemption and then new creation. We don't understand that Jesus makes sense of things. And, uh, and note that it doesn't tell us what Jesus said to them. He is in an, an intimate relationship with them and, he, and with each of us. And he tells each of us our story, a story about himself in our lives. And it says, as they came near the village to which they were going, he walked ahead as if he were going on. That wasn't play acting. Jesus won't force himself on us. If they hadn't have invited him in, I'm sure he would have continued walking. No, he awaited the invitation to come in. William Barclay wrote, God gave to human beings the greatest and the most perilous gift in the world, the gift of free will. We can use it to invite Christ to enter our lives or to allow him to pass on. Well, they asked him in. It says they urged him strongly, saying, Stay with us, because it's almost evening and the day is now nearly over. 
can sense them trying to find reasons to say, well, you, you can't keep out walking uh, uh, on the road now. It's getting too late. So, so come with us. You should stay with us. And while you're staying with us, do a little more talking about this, please. Um, abide with me. Fast falls the eventide. Uh, that, the hymn, of course, is based on this passage. And it expresses that, that yearning of our hearts, that the Lord would be with us. And that's met by Jesus' response, the promise, I am with you always. And so he went in to stay with them. And he probably uh, stayed with them at their house. And when he was at table with them, it says, he took bread, blessed and broke it, and gave it to them. Now, there's no doubt that Luke's readers, uh, when they hear those words, will think of the Last Supper, which they've only just seen a few verses before, and of the New Covenant, in our Lord's blood, and of Holy Eucharist, which, they, uh, which began with the Last Supper and which Jesus told us to do in remembrance of him, and which, of course, the community re reading these words would have been doing regularly together. No doubt they'll also think of the table fellowship together. We read in Acts chapter 2 that the early church devoted themselves to the apostles' teaching and fellowship, to the breaking of bread and the prayers. Day by day, as they spent much time together in the temple, they broke bread at home and ate their food with glad and generous hearts, praising God and having the goodwill of all the people. Jesus is with us as we open our homes in hospitality breaking bread with one another and the stranger. And Jesus is there. That's a joy that awaits us in the months to come. And note uh, that it, Jesus is really acting as the host here. Uh, it says that he took the bread and broke it and gave it to them. People have said that uh, when we invite Jesus in, we, we give him the, the deed to the house. And that's really true. Well, it then says, that there, Then their eyes were opened, and they recognized him, and he vanished from their sight. Open our eyes, Lord, we want to see Jesus, we sing. And that is their experience. And of course, the way Luke words it here, it's pretty clear he's trying to, to say something very important. And right begins at the very end of this passage, too, about how they share and how they recognize Jesus in the breaking of the bread. Again, obviously, not just suddenly, oh, suddenly the candle was right on Jesus' face and they realized, oh, gee, that's Jesus. No, this is all the Lord making himself real to us. And uh, they recognize Jesus in the breaking of the bread. Their lives will never again be the same. A new song, a new story. There's a, perhaps an allusion here to the story of Adam and Eve. I'm going to read a little bit of what N.T. Wright says about this. He says, think of the first meal in the Bible. The moment is heavy with significance. It says the woman took some of the fruit and ate it. She gave it to her husband and he ate it. Then the eyes of them both were opened and they knew that they were naked. The tale was told over and over as the beginning of the woes that had come upon the human race. Death itself was traced to the moment of rebellion. The whole creation was subjected to decay, futility and sorrow. Now Luke, echoing that story, describes the first meal of the new creation. He took the bread, blessed it, broke it, and gave it to them. Then the eyes of both of them were opened, and they recognized him. The couple at Emmaus, probably Cleopas and Mary, husband and wife, 
discover that the long curse has been broken. Death itself has been defeated. God's new creation, brimming with life and joy and new possibility, has burst in upon the world of decay and sorrow. And, uh, well, their response to this, well, first it's to share with one another. Were not our hearts burning within us, they said, while he was talking to us on the road, while he was opening the scriptures to us. Jesus opening the word to us. Um, our testimony like theirs is that he sets our hearts ablaze. And uh, we have um, written on our hearts uh, coming up uh, a study starting this coming Wednesday where we're going to examine the scripture together and how we can really experience all that God wants scripture to be for us so that we might indeed be able to echo the words of these disciples. And I invite us to participate in that uh, via Zoom this coming Wednesday evening for four weeks. And uh, it says that uh, were not our hearts burning within us while he was opening the scriptures to us and talking to us on the road. The journey, one of the oldest biblical symbols from Abraham onwards. But it's important to remember that the journey is not a vacation. <laughs> it's a pilgrimage. Diana Butler Bass talks about the difference. She says, being a tourist means experiencing something new. Being a pilgrim means becoming someone new. So experiencing something new, becoming someone new. As we journey with Jesus, our hearts uh, burn within us. And so first they share with one another, and then they share with others. It says, that same hour they got up and returned to Jerusalem. That means right away, that term, that same hour. So they didn't worry about the late hour anymore, apparently. Um, and the reason they didn't is they had good news to share. Hope for all those who were struggling without hope and discouraged, just like they had been. We see that they have a boldness facing whatever dangers might be needed to be faced, and, and energy. We see the same in Peter in today's Acts passage. No more denying that he knows Jesus. No, now, right in front of the very authorities who uh, had arranged for Jesus to be crucified, he proclaims the good news. Well, it says that they went back and they found the eleven and their companions gathered together. And they were saying, the Lord has risen indeed and he has appeared to Simon. Again, we see the grace of Jesus in the looking out for his lost sheep. Because Peter too, of course, was discouraged, crushed by what had happened and his own denial of Jesus three times. So another lost sheep has been sought, has been sought out. And this encounter of our risen Lord with Peter is mentioned here and in 1 Corinthians chapter 15 as being something that Paul had received as of first importance and being shared. But we're not told the details about it. We don't have anywhere where it says what, what happened there. It was meant just for Peter. Again, like Jesus' words from Holy Scripture to the two, we see an intimacy here and a unique relationship. But what we do know is that its effect on Peter was so profound that it convinced the eleven and their companions that Jesus had indeed risen. Beginning the fulfillment of Jesus' charge to Peter in Luke chapter 22, you, when once you have turned back, strengthen your brothers. After Pentecost and the infilling of the Holy Spirit, we see him further along the path, uh, even in Acts chapter 3. 
Remember, Jesus isn't finished with you yet. The last lines of your story have not been written. Uh, and all of us experience the transforming work of his presence, his life, his spirit in our lives. And uh, God continues to write that awesome story for us. And uh, note too the reminder that Jesus didn't reveal himself to these two because, well, they're not very important, but uh, the eleven were, and so they needed to uh, be encouraged. And that's why uh, Jesus uh, appeared to them, because uh, they could encourage the really important people. No, they were already encouraged. They already believed that Jesus had risen. And so what happens instead is, is that they are able to celebrate that together and to be strengthened together as they share one another's stories. As Will Willimon says, the church, when it is half true to its promise, is a group of people on a road where, wonder of wonders, the risen Christ meets us. And so we share fellowship with others who also know and love the risen Lord and experience him in our midst, which are actually the next verses after today's passage. And we share with one another about his presence in our lives, and that builds us all up further. And so they told what had happened on the road and how Jesus had been made known to them in the breaking of the bread. Word, where it says, we're not our hearts burning within us while he opened the scriptures to us, and sacrament. And um, the message to the readers of this story that Luke is wanting to convey is an invitation to enter the story ourselves. It's meant for all of us. And that's really why I think it is a, a beloved story. Uh, because it's not just about others, it's our story too. All of us are meant to know the presence of our risen Lord with us on our journeys. Many of us, especially in these COVID-19 times, are struggling with our own dark valleys of disappointment, discouragement, fear, and grief, and illness. Just as Jesus made himself known to these two, so he wants to make himself known to us. May we never doubt this. May we never question whether we are important or precious enough for him to want to do this. He loved each of us enough to give his life for us. He did this so that we might indeed share his life, that he might share it with each of us. We are not alone. Jesus is here right now sharing the journey with us. We can, each of us, encounter him this morning through word and sacrament and one another. And we can, each of us, be used to share a message of good news, of hope and encouragement in word and in deed to a world that so desperately needs to hear it. As Judith Carrick writes, the gift of Emmaus awaits you wherever you are on that road. Pray that when the risen Lord comes to you, your eyes may be opened so you can behold him in all his glory. And then, renewed in faith, run to tell others the good news. May it be so for us all. Amen. And if you don't see me around for the next little while after today, you'll know uh, in which tower I'm locked up. <laughs> now let's affirm our faith using the words of the Nicene Creed on our screen. Let us confess our faith as we say, 
We believe in one God, the Father, the Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, of all that is seen and unseen. We believe in one Lord Jesus Christ, the only Son of God, eternally begotten of the Father, God from God, light from light, true God from true God, begotten not made, of one being with the Father. Through him all things were made. For us and for our salvation he came down from heaven. By the power of the Holy Spirit he became incarnate from the Virgin Mary and was made man. For our sake he was crucified under Pontius Pilate. He suffered death and was buried. On the third day he rose again in accordance with the scriptures. He ascended into heaven and is seated at the right hand of the Father. He will come again in glory to judge the living and the dead, and his kingdom will have no end. We believe in the Holy Spirit, the Lord, the giver of life, who proceeds from the Father. With the Father and the Son he is worshipped and glorified. He has spoken through the prophets. We believe in one holy Catholic and apostolic church. We acknowledge one baptism for the forgiveness of sins. We look for the resurrection of the dead and the life of the world to come. Amen. And now Doreen will lead us in the prayers of the people. Enjoy the hope. Let us pray to the source of all life, saying, Hear us, Lord of glory. Let our risen Saviour fill us with the joy of his holy and life-giving resurrection. Let us pray to the Lord. Hear us, Lord, Hear us, Lord. Lord of glory. That isolated and persecuted churches may find fresh strength in the Easter Gospel. Let us pray to the Lord. Hear us, Lord of glory. That he may grant us humility to be subject to one another in Christian love. Let us pray to the Lord. Hear there us, Lord, Lord of glory. That he may provide for those who lack food, work, or shelter. Let us pray to the Lord. Hear there us, Lord, Lord of glory. That by his power, Wars and famine may cease through all the earth. Here I invite you to pray for all in areas of conflict around the world. Let us pray to the Lord. Hear Here us, Lord, Lord of glory. That he may reveal the light of his presence to the sick, the weak, and the dying. I invite you to name anyone on your heart this morning, either silently or aloud. That they may be comforted and strengthened, let us pray to the Lord. Hear, Hear us, Lord, Lord of glory. That he may send the fire of the Holy Spirit upon his people, that we may bear faithful witness to his resurrection. Let us pray to the Lord. Hear, Hear us, the Lord, Lord of glory. And now a prayer of thanksgiving for the life of the Duke of Edinburgh. God of eternal life and love, we give thanks today for the life and witness of Philip, Duke of Edinburgh. For his service in pursuit of peace as a naval officer, for his service to the Queen, as a wise counselor and companion. For his commitment in marriage for over 70 years, in witness to mutual respect and love. For his commitment to nurturing family and guiding with wisdom their growth and development. For his encouragement of young people around the world to skill development, physical health, adventure and service through the Duke of Edinburgh Award for his care and advocacy for all of creation, 
for a life long lived selflessly in service to others. We remember with thanksgiving and commit him into your keeping this day in the sure and certain hope of resurrection to eternal life. May he rest in peace and rise in glory. Amen. Amen. A prayer for all who are bereaved. Grant, O Lord, to all who are bereaved the spirit of faith and courage, that they may have strength to meet the days to come with steadfastness and patience. Not sorrowing as those without hope, but in thankful remembrance of your great goodness, and in the joyful expectation of eternal life with those they love. And this we ask in the name of Jesus Christ, our Saviour. Amen. Please join me now in the prayer in response to COVID-19. God of compassion, keep us under the shadow of your wings in this time of uncertainty and distress. Sustain and support the anxious and fearful, and lift up all who are brought low, that we may rejoice in your comfort, knowing that nothing can separate us from your love in Christ Jesus our Lord. You have taught us to love our neighbor and to care for those in need, as if we were caring for you. In this time of anxiety, give us strength to comfort the fearful, to tend the sick, to reach out with and hold one another in our hearts, when we cannot hold one another in our arms. Be close to those who are ill, afraid, or in isolation. In their loneliness, be their consolation. In, in their anxiety, be their hope. In their darkness, be their light. Through him who suffered alone on the cross, but raised with you in glory, Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. Dear friends in Christ, God is steadfast in love and infinite in mercy, welcoming sinners and inviting us to this table. Let us confess our sins, confident in God's forgiveness. Most merciful God, we confess that we have sinned against you in thought, word, and deed, by what we have done and by what we have left undone. We have not loved you with our whole heart. We have not loved our neighbors as ourselves. We are truly sorry and we humbly repent. For the sake of your Son, Jesus Christ, have mercy on us and forgive us that we may delight in your will and walk in your ways to the glory of your name. Amen. Almighty God, have mercy upon you. Pardon and deliver you from all your sins. Confirm and strengthen you in all goodness and keep you in eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. And now as we have received God's peace, we have that gift of peace to share with one another. The peace of the Lord be always with you. Wherever we may be, let's greet one another with the peace of Christ. And now at this time we pause to offer to the Lord our time, talents, and treasure remembering that the gifts that we've been given are gifts to be shared. In our parish family, one way that we share our treasure is through the offerings that we give to St. Paul's. And I'd like to thank everybody for continuing to give financially to St. Paul's to help us carry out the mission of spreading the uh, good news of our Lord's 
love through our words and our deeds. We'll listen now to our offertory anthem, the Larsh hymn, Lord Jesus, you shall be my song as I journey, while our screen shows a slide that mentions ways that we can participate in our mission by sharing our support. Now let's share together the prayer over the gifts. Creator of all, you wash away our sins in water. You give us new birth by the Spirit and redeem us in the blood of Christ. As we celebrate the resurrection, renew your gift of life within us. We ask this in the name of Jesus Christ, the risen Lord. Amen. And our Eucharistic prayer today, which is one of the most uh, ancient Eucharistic prayers we have, is on our screen. The Lord be with you. Lift up your hearts. Let us give thanks to the Lord our God. It is right to give our thanks and praise. We give you thanks and praise, Almighty God, through your beloved Son, Jesus Christ, our Savior and Redeemer. He is your living word through whom you have created all things. By the power of the Holy Spirit, he took flesh of the Virgin Mary and shared our human nature. He lived and died as one of us, to reconcile us to you, the God and Father of all. In fulfillment of your will, he stretched out his hands in suffering to bring release to those who place their hope in you. And so he won for you a holy people. He chose to bear our griefs and sorrows and to give up his life on the cross that he might shatter the chains of evil and death 
and banish the darkness of sin and despair. By his resurrection, he brings us into the light of your presence. Now with all creation, we raise our voices to proclaim the glory of your name. Holy, holy, holy Lord, God of power and might, heaven and earth are full of your glory. Hosanna in the highest. Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Hosanna in the highest. Holy and gracious God, accept our praise through your Son, our Savior Jesus Christ, who on the night he was handed over to suffering and death, took bread, gave you thanks, saying, Take and eat. This is my body, which is broken for you. In the same way, he took the cup, saying, This is my blood, which is shed for you. When you do this, do it in memory of me. Remembering, therefore, his death and resurrection, we offer you this bread and this cup, giving thanks that you have made us worthy to stand in your presence and serve you. We ask you to send your Holy Spirit upon the offering of your holy church. Gather into one all who share in these holy mysteries, filling them with the Holy Spirit and confirming their faith in the truth that together we may praise you and give you glory through your servant, Jesus Christ. All glory and honor are yours, Father and Son, with the Holy Spirit in the Holy Church, now and forever. Amen. Now as our Savior taught us, let us pray. Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as in heaven. Give us today our daily bread. Forgive us our sins as we forgive those who sin against us. Save us from the time of trial and deliver us from evil. For the kingdom, the power, and the glory are yours, now and forever. Amen. Lord, we died with you on the cross. Now we are raised to new life. We were buried in your tomb. Now we share in your resurrection. Live in us that we may live in you. These are the gifts of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. the body of Christ, given for you. Amen. The blood of Christ, shed for you. And at St. Paul's, we have the opportunity to partake of communion physically as well as spiritually. Consecrated wafers, uh, each infused with drops of wine, can be picked up on Saturdays between 2 and 2.45 uh, or by appointment, uh, just by either phone or email. Uh, from a the place there, there are is a table just inside the main entrance, which is the one that uh, is nearest to Sundance on the green and has a, a park bench by it. They're in individual paper cups and covered with a sealed baggie to make them safe for everybody. And the uh, recommendation is that you uh, hold on to the wafer and uh, partake physically 
during communion time, which is right now at this moment in the service. All of us, whether or not we're partaking physically of the bread and wine today, have the opportunity to feed on our Lord in our hearts by faith with thanksgiving. And so I invite us all to say the prayer for communion on our screens together. My Jesus, I believe that you are present in the most holy sacrament. I love you above all things, and I desire to receive you into my soul. Since I cannot at this moment receive you sacramentally, come at least spiritually into my heart. I embrace you as if you were already there and unite myself wholly to you. Never permit me to be separated from you. Amen. Now let's share together the prayer after communion. Author of life divine, in the breaking of bread we know the risen Lord. Feed us always in these mysteries, that we may show your glory to all the world. We ask this in the name of Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. Glory to God whose power working in us can do infinitely more than we can ask or imagine. Glory to God from generation to generation, in the Church and in Christ Jesus, forever and ever. Amen. And the peace of God which passes all understanding, keep your hearts and minds in the knowledge and love of God and of God's Son, Jesus Christ our Lord. And the blessing of God Almighty, Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit be among you and remain with you always. Our closing hymn is Lord of Life, and uh, the words are on our screen. If you haven't uh, sung it before, we'll very likely be familiar with the tune as it's uh, Edelweiss. Lord of life, hear us sing praise and joyful thanksgiving. Lord of love, hear we bring all our living and living. Glory to God, may you hear our praise, ever guard and guide us. Lord of life, all our days, journey onward beside us. Lord who died, Lord who rose, grant that your way be mine. Of God will. 
wind that blows Be with us on our highway Glory to God, may you hear our song Grant your way be my way Spirit of God, make me strong Be with me on the highway Lord, we know as we grow Life has much to enthrall us That will call us Glory to God May you hear our praise Call us, guard us, guide us Lord of life All our days Journey ever beside us And uh, everyone is invited to join our post-service virtual coffee time uh, via Zoom. Uh, the slide on our screen uh, shows uh, uh, how you can get the link that you'll need uh, to do that. And it would be wonderful to share a time of fellowship with you. Go in peace to love and serve the Lord. Alleluia. Thanks be to God. Hallelujah.